Was our race genetically engineered 6,000 years ago? Were we created by beings from distant space to work as laborers towards some unknown end? From ancient cave paintings to the conquest of space, we have grappled with the truths of our beginnings. But what if the question of our origin falls outside the realm of social acceptability? What would happen to our culture if we were to discover that we, as a race, are no more than the result of a genetic experiment conducted by a superior life form? There's no time. Hey everybody, it's episode 103 about the Anunnaki and ancient aliens. Yeah. Alien astronauts, all that kind of shit. Yeah, we, we primed this show <laughs> with those two uh, movie reviews that we did last week, you know, with uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. So yeah. So this is kind of a related yes, topic. Yeah, we're doing like a whole theme. Yeah, I'm pr- we're pretty sure that uh, Ridley Scott got his ideas from this subject here, you know, which is uh, yeah. Zachariah Sitchin and uh, what's it? Eric Von Daniken, Chariots and, of the Gods, that Chariots kind of, of stuff. The gods, They're like, right. oh, the ancient uh, the ancient aliens ancient came aliens. here and built all the shit, you know, or yeah. gave the ancient people their our magic alien technology. Our religions were leftover stories of what happened between us and beings from the heavens, you know. Yeah, right. That kind of stuff. Wasn't that kind of like the fourth Indiana Jones movie, too? Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, basically. You know. Basically. That, Boy, although, that was that was, although that was bad. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't think they should. You know they're going to do it again. They're making another one, I heard. Really? Oh. That's not. Shia LaBeouf swinging through the trees with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, with the. Seriously, with the when I saw that scene, the first, I saw the, I saw the movie on a plane. Shia LaBeouf. And I'm like, I'm watching it going. Yeah, that really you really somebody wrote that down on a piece of paper in a script, and then you got a whole bunch of people to go along with yeah, it. Yeah, they couldn't and no have one cast that any better. No one. Shia LaBeouf is exactly the kind of guy you need swinging through the trees with the buggies. Exactly. <laughs> you can't even trust that dude inside a Kentucky Fried Chicken. But to me, that was like yeah. way worse than the whole refrigerator but, nuclear yeah. blast thing. Yeah, it didn't bother me too much. I mean, at least that's yeah. sort of plausible. Yeah, you know, a nuclear bomb is a bomb. You know, if yeah, you, so, you, you can protect yourself from a bomb by going, yeah, the maybe not real well. I, I think that it, it blew that uh, it blew that refrigerator out a couple hundred yards. It, it'd be hard to survive that, I think. Well, yeah, it, it was like, tumbling. It would rattle around. your skull around yeah. on the inside because I mean, your yeah. refrigerator's kind of hard. Beat you to inside. death in there, especially ones from back in those days. Mm-hmm. I mean, nowadays they're all made. Everything's made of plastic. Yeah, they were steel right, back in those days. Sheet metal. Yeah, right. So, but yeah, before we get to that. Um, you know, we want to do our regular shout outs and all that usual crap that we do. Um, as we said, uh, our last movie reviews were a twofer. It was Prometheus and Alien Covenant. So go check that out if you yeah. haven't yet. Also check out our Zazzle store at Zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. And we still have those really cool kick-ass t-shirts and a tote bag. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, more yeah, people need to buy those because I spent a long time designing those. I'm going to make everybody feel guilty now. Yeah, you're going to guilt them. <laughs> I'm going to guilt them. Yeah. Come on, buy it. <laughs> also, we're still trying to get to our goal to $1,000 a month on Patreon. Yeah, I changed it on, Pat- on uh, Patreon. Yeah. And, and um, when we hit the $1,000, we are going to release the new show. Yeah. I think you guys are going to like the new show. Yeah. It's if gonna you don't be like, like the new fun. show, you could always cut us off of Patreon. So, no, I didn't like that. Yeah, Pull see, back off. you can do that Yeah, if you want that to. too. And then we'll totally, stop making that show. Totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally okay. You got nothing to lose. But yeah, I mean, we got what with almost four thousand subscribers. If ever, if, if only like one in four people, you know, were to to, to donate a dollar, then you know, actually, don't do a dollar because if you do a dollar, Patreon gets most of that dollar. It's not even really. I think we end up making only like ten cents. The last I heard, I don't know if they changed it. It's better to to give like at least two dollars. Yeah. That way, we'll probably get like a dollar from yeah. that. Which you know, that's which strange. you know, if you know, if we only had a thousand people give us a dollar, actually, if we about seven hundred, I think, if we had seven hundred people give us one uh, two dollars, yeah, or a dollar fifty, we'd be $2. all right. Two dollars. Yeah, we definitely would make it. You kids that grew up in the eighties know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Better off dead. Two dollars. <laughs> what are you talking about? Better off dead. You never saw that with no. John Cusack? No. Okay. I'll just, 
I think I referenced it on the show before, and again, you were just like looking at me like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Yeah, it's a movie. It's a lot of people who grew up in the '80s saw that movie. It was on cable. I didn't see that one. Oh, it was funny. It's still funny. I saw it the other day. Um, And speaking of Patreon, we actually have a new patron whose name is Natalia. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. Thanks. And also one of our other patrons. Now, did we decide? What are we at now on patrons? Uh, 30 or 33 patrons. What are we getting? Oh, about 300 a month? Yeah, so something like that. Okay, we got a ways to go. Yeah, we still got a long way to go, but you know, yeah. it's, it it's common. It won't take that long, I don't think. And yeah. did we decide that this, his name's Jamin, right? Jamin. Jamin. Yeah. No, Jamin. Jamin, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he actually upped his support on Patreon. Oh, he did? Oh, great. So, hooray. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, because every time, it's like I always forget, because I was like, we established how to pronounce his name. And then every time I have to pronounce it again, I'm always just like, shit. That's Jamin, I think. And I can't, yeah, see, yeah. I think it is. Because I think it was, I was trying to get all fancy and like yeah. French or Spanish. Overthinking it. it. Yeah, well, that's kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, yeah, so thank you for doing that. Also, um, I think I mentioned on last week's show that I've started like designing some kind of giallo themed card games and board games and shit like that. Yeah. I actually have three games done and two of them have expansion packs. Yeah. Uh, the first one, which is a murder mystery game, it's kind of like Clue, um, but you can, you know, you can like replay it and uh, stuff. It's not like just one murder mystery where you figure it out and then you can't play it anymore. It's a different one every time. And uh, that one's done. I've actually ordered a copy of it and a copy of the expansion pack. And if I like how it looks when I yeah. get it, then I can put that one on sale. I've seen the plans for it. It looks really good. Uh, but when we get it in person, we'll, we'll see. You we'll know, see how it came out. Because you never right. know. I mean, you know, when you design shit, and if those of you who are graphic designers, even if you're not a graphic designer, I'm right. sure you probably know, it's like when you design something, the way it looks on the screen sometimes is very, very different yeah. than how it looks when it's printed. <laughs> if all goes well, we'll make a commercial for it. We'll yeah. uh, put a commercial on the show. And I also did another one that was kind of like, um, it's kind of like, Mystery Mansion or Betrayal at House on the Hill, where you kind of like build the mansion as you go. It's like a hundred, but it's kind of based on the Suspiria Three Mothers kind of thing. I was initially going to call it Our Ladies of Sorrow until I discovered that there was already an RPG that was called that. So I decided to call it The Three Sorrows instead. So that'll be the next one. And then I also made one that's like, it's like a kind of a card game, like Apples to Apples or Cards Against Humanity or Schmovie or something, where... Uh, it's just like cards with words on them that are like giallo movie titles and like you make the best one and then you know pitch a movie to the judge or whatever and get points so uh, that one is called the cursed names of nightmares and uh, that'll be the third one out and that also has like a horror gore extension pack so uh, it'll be fun so like I said I'm trying to order all of them to see how they come out in the printing and then I'll put them up for sale and I'll let you guys know when that happens now, let's go to our news stories. I was initially only going to do one, and I wanted to do like a space-themed one because we're talking about the Anunnaki and stuff. I said, oh, we'll do like a whole fun space show because, I mean, to be honest, we've been doing like a lot of true crime lately, and it's yeah. kind of a bummer. So uh, I thought this one would be kind of more fun and shit. But then... Speaking of space, though, oh, before we forget, yeah. I want to mention something. Last night, we saw a Crustle movie. That's right, we did. Watch Soldier. Yeah, because remember we space talked about Rambo. it. Yeah, we talked about it, it on, on uh, the, what you call it, on the yeah. Prometheus and stuff show, because you were trying to cram it into the, yeah because everything has to be part of the Crustal Spears, yeah, yes, it's we all, all know. Part of the Spear, yeah. So, you know, so he was trying to cram that into the whole uh, Prometheus and alien mythos. What did you think? Um, I didn't, uh, well, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of see what you're getting at, where yeah. it's like kind of, it's not really exactly the same, because he was a, a guy, he wasn't yeah, he was a real, an yeah. android, or he wasn't a replicant. According to the guys who who wrote the script, all right, they wanted it to be that he was replaced, he and his team right. was replaced by replicants. By, like Roy Batty's. Well, they know, were like Roy, genetically engineered well, supermen. Genetically men. engineered, but they said he, there was evidently something to him. Remember they said there was some little, little tweaks and stuff more to it. A little it. something, something. It's supposed to be kind of like <laughs> a, a, a... The story goes is that it was supposed to be prototype replicants. Right, oh, okay, I got you. Like Roy Batty. Remember Roy yeah, Batty, yeah. Roy? There were, there yeah. were guys like that. I can see it. It was a pretty good movie, though. Yeah, but like, like Space Rambo. Space Rambo. Like you said, Crussell says very little in it. Says very little. He doesn't have to say anything, though. That's true. He just Crussell's looks, looking good in that movie, too. He's, he, he, he he's, does, yeah. He's he, looks all, he looks all rugged and mean. Yeah, he's like got buffed up. Yeah, and he's always like staring at the camera, like yeah. looking all yeah. like he's going to like rip your fucking backbone yeah. out of your shirt. 
I thought it was, you know, I thought it was cool. Flick had good, yeah, old, it was pretty school, good. old school effects, uh, lots of good sets. It was an expensive movie, and they didn't. It didn't make any. Yeah, money you could back. tell. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Waterworld. Remember how Waterworld yeah. looked, like Waterworld and uh, um, Riddick One. Yeah, it's and a similar kind of like Dune. It had you know like the some of the guys who was fighting thought... kind of looked like the side of car. Yeah. I thought yeah. the cinematography on it was kind of nice. You know what I think a lot of the problem was? The title. The title, yeah. A very forgettable title. Soldier. Soldier. Yeah, big deal. It's just, you know, it doesn't have all uh, pizzazz. It doesn't mm-hmm. even, like, it's not very memorable. Like I said, it sounds like a Jean-Claude Van Damme yeah. directed DVD I think had they, I movie. Think had they given it, I think they had they given it a better title. It might have done better. It might have done better and it might have been remembered. Yeah. But I'm, yeah, it I got matter. it on Blu-ray. It was good. I got it cheap on Blu-ray. I recommend that movie to any fans of that genre. It was much better than I was expecting. Also. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. It was good. It was, it was good. Space Rambo. Space Rambo. Yeah, Space Rambo. Yeah. So, uh, okay. But before we get to the space story, a couple of people sent me this Florida Man video, and I have to address it because it's Florida Man. And we live in Florida. And we were just talking about the whole alligator thing and like the guy chucking the alligator in through the window, the window of the Wendy's drive through or whatever. So this is a video that went viral in this past week. And I actually find the, I found the video on the Orlando Sentinel website. So here's, and it starts with a Florida man who carried a live alligator into a Jacksonville convenience store to get some beer and ran around inside the business with the reptile tucked under his arm, has been arrested. (laughs) Surprisingly. Yeah. Uh, The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission said Wednesday that Robert Timothy Barr, 28, who was also known as Robbie Stratton, I don't know why he has like a... Is that, you know, is, got he, an alias. is he like a superhero? Yeah, and that's he's like got his name. <laughs> I guess that's really weird. I'm like, anybody has got two names, like you must be into some sketchies though. So he was arrested, as was his buddy, Kevin Keenum, 23. Both men were charged with illegal possession of an American alligator, because that's a thing. <laughs> uh, illegal exhibition of dangerous wildlife. So okay. hey, here it is. Yeah. And cruelty to animals. Right. So something that you normally get away with, they got charged for because uh, they did it on video. But they if you the see the store. video, I mean, I feel bad for the alligator. How big is the alligator? Four to five feet. Okay. He's carrying it underneath his arm? Yeah. Okay. The he's best thing, it's, a, it's yeah, it's a viral video. I'll put it in the in the YouTube right. video, like the part, because it is actually kind of funny. Like I yeah. said, I, I feel I kind of bad. It. I respect it. I feel it. kind of bad. Yeah. So Barr was seen at a viral video running around the convenience store with the four to five foot alligator. This is the best part, though. He told the television station, WJAX 47, that he didn't know how he ended up with the alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, hold on, hold on. No, hold on. now, hold on, hold on, let, hold me, on. let me, let me. He said he didn't know how he, didn't know how he ended up with the alligator? No. I, I got to get a better glass. I got to get a better glass. I got to get, I, I see. He needs the, more liquor for this. I need more this. liquor for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me drink out of here. <laughs> Let's yeah. see. Don't don't just spill in it case I don't know how I got that alligator. <laughs> well, that ties right in to the next thing that he said. So he said he doesn't remember how he got the alligator. He said, "Quote: This store sells some good liquor, and I drank a lot of it that night. I don't even remember coming up here, mm-hmm. <laughs> much less with an alligator under right. his arm. Where do you get an alligator? Like." He's him and his buddy are drunk, I guess. Yeah. Running around the streets, whatever it is they're doing. He decides he's dr- he's so drunk that he doesn't remember going to the convenience store. But you know, he's like, okay, well, at some stage we have to go to the convenience store and gotta get more beer. We need an alligator. Yeah. Find me an alligator, and he did. <laughs> he found an. No, he had that alligator at his house, man. He's lying. <laughs> <laughs> he the raised alligator, that alligator. The alligator. The only way you can run around with a five foot alligator without it having to just he beat had, you to death with that tail is that that you that that alligator knows. Yeah, you. he had it had duct tape over its mouth. Yeah, but still, this the tail alone at five feet, a tail could just hurt you. Well, yeah, it's you're like I said, it's it's not a huge alligator, but it's no. like a, it's a decent size. That would be a handful though, four or five feet. That's a pretty good handful. Yeah, one of the men. It says one of the men stepped on the alligator's snout, which was wrapped in duct tape. Mm-hmm. He then grabbed it by the neck, held it aloft, and yelled, Florida State, baby! Florida State, baby! <laughs> uh, Even though Florida State, I should add, that's the Seminoles. The Gators, that's mm-hmm. the University of Florida. So he, get, he got get a, your he shit got, straight. Yeah, got, but I know what he's talking about. <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. Florida State. 
Poor alligator. alligator. I feel so bad for this alligator. It's all fun and games. Yeah, so... Uh, what happened and then, to the alligator? I don't know. They didn't say. I mean, I guess they took Probably it to custody. Let it go. Yeah, I hope they just let it go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so this guy was like... <laughs> they told me what I did was stupid. <laughs> they had to tell you that? <laughs> no shit. <laughs> yeah, they told me what I did was stupid, and that I would be facing some charges. <laughs> Probably go to jail. Probably not. One way or the other. I won't guess be long. It's, be it's long all right anyway. with him now. You would probably give him fucking ten days. We'll today. see. He says. Uh, they're all first degree misdemeanors. They ain't shit. So I don't. He'll probably just get a fine or something. Yeah, he'll be doing the rounds on the on the uh, on the uh, YouTube talk shows. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Because it's just like became a total meme. Like this yeah. dumbass like running through a convenience store. It's a good idea. With That's an alligator brilliant, man. So. Yeah, but you'd only be able to figure that out in a, in a state like Florida or maybe Ohio. Yeah, Ohio. <laughs> maybe Ohio. Ohio. Ohio is the Florida, the, of the north. Florida of the north, or the yeah. Florida of the Midwest, if yeah. you prefer. So yeah, so I had I had a lot of listeners send me that story and were like, "Check this out." So yeah, it really happened. It is, like I said, it's a very funny video. Even though I feel bad for the poor little alligator. I don't know why I did that. Well, because it's not more alcohol, it's, it's just more jar. I know. <laughs> well, I told you that you should fill the whole jar up drink. with something that looks I like liquor. Can't drink all and that shit. Just... I can't drink all that shit. Well, I didn't say you had to fill it up with al- actual alcohol. Yeah, you could fill it up with something that looked like alcohol. You could just fill it up with water, and you no, could say it was I moonshine. I couldn't drink that. I couldn't drink that. You could say it was no. moonshine. No, man, That's I'm legitimate, you man. I'm legitimate. This is the real thing. I'm, it is. If I'm, yeah. gonna, if I'm gonna fill it up. I'm that gonna, is real booze. Mine's real booze too. Real thing in it. I got. I got a screwdriver. I don't but see, I, I just I don't look how it. now my jar feels inadequate compared yes, to your jar. It is inadequate. Very inadequate. Thank you. <laughs> In America, size rules. The bigger, the better. <laughs> size matters. I got a shirt for Jenny. It says that on the front of it. it says, <laughs> oh, size matters. Unless you're talking about a tumor. <laughs> Anyway, so, okay, so the other news story is not exactly a news story, and I wanted to know if you knew about this, because I never heard of this shit, and I was just, like, reading about it, uh, because I was looking for space-related news stories, and I'm like, what the fuck, I never heard of that. Have you heard of the Space Kingdom of Asgardia? No. Okay. No. So it's not just me. No. So this is an actual thing that this guy started. He's, like, a Russian uh, scientist. And philanthropist, and he's a billionaire, like he owns a business and everything like that. And he has decided that he's going to start the first space nation. Okay. So it's going to be like in a, um, I'm guessing that it's going to be in a, uh, you know, like a space station type of thing. Eventually, he wants to establish a moon colony. And he has a website. He has actually launched a satellite into okay. space. like on a, So he's way ahead of like other people. Okay, yeah. So he does actually have a satellite in space. He did pay to have that put up there. And that is the first foray into... He wants this to be a, a nation state of its own. The right. Space Kingdom of Asgardia. And if you want to sign up and you want to live on his space station or on his purported moon colony that will be coming soon, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Um, then you can sign up and you can become a citizen. Okay, yeah. Now, apparently a whole bunch of people did that. Um, the first time I did, this has only been, I think he first announced it in late 2016. And then he's actually been trying to get the, uh, this year he's been trying to get the UN to recognize him as a nation state. He's not trying to like take over the universe or anything like that. He's just trying to get, he's just trying to get his one space kingdom I understand it. Yeah. seen as like a sovereign nation. And it's like, if does you, it have a home planet or is it just an area in space? It's going to be an area in space. But okay. eventually, like I said, he wants to establish a moon colony. Uh, so you can apparently, you can go to the website and you can apply for citizenship. Now, a bunch of people did it and then apparently they were like, there was too many or they were getting a bunch of bums. I don't know what it was. So they just said, oh, we're going to make the application process harder. So I think they're to about 250,000, 250, 300,000 people. Yeah. Because apparently, you know, there are a lot of people who want to get the fuck off this planet, which, you know, you can't blame them sometimes. Yes, yeah, so he definitely wants to uh, 
<laughs> that reminds me. Is, and he actually has the means to do so, which is kind of funny. Now, when I was looking, when I was reading the Wikipedia page about this guy, because I'm like, Space Kingdom of Asgard? And he actually has a satellite? I never heard of that. How yeah. did I never hear of that? So I was like reading all about it. It's this big, long fucking Wikipedia page, and he's totally serious. What's the satellite do? It's not just... It's, Nothing. It's just there. Is it, even, is, it, is it broadcasting any signals or anything? Oh, I don't know. I think he just put it up there as like, this is the area. This is going to be like contained in this satellite. It's just a little bitty satellite. Right. But he, I think that was just like his first going, look, I have the money to do it. It's ridiculous. But the funny thing is when I was reading the Wikipedia page about this, they're like, this, surprisingly, this is not the first guy to try to pull this kind of stunt where I'm just going to go up in space and take it over. However, there was one, and this happened way the hell back in 1949. There was this guy named James Mangan, I want to say, or Mangan. He wanted to start the Nation of Celestial Space, okay. or Celestia. Right. Now, this guy was a lot more ballsy. He's like, I own all the space. Yeah. So if you want to come up here, you got to pay me. Yeah. Because all of, the space is This kind of mine. reminds me of like uh, back in the 1400s when you had Europeans, all right, and European nobles and kings just claiming all of the new world. That's exactly what this guy was just, trying to yeah, do. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and like Spain would claim all of the new world. England claimed all of the new world. Everybody claimed all of the new world. They didn't have a single troop there. I didn't send, you know what I mean? Nothing. No well, yeah. physical means to implement any of these claims. All that stuff got worked out later by the American colonies. America and Mexico worked it out. By fighting it out over who owned it, the Europeans were all still We'll come with there. guns and shit later, but that for shit's now, that shit's ours. We Man, own your shit. Yeah, we, that shit over it's ours. They'll just draw a map on a on a globe and go, yeah, this is all ours. They don't even consult any of the Native Americans that live there or anything. You I know. love that. I love you just that. I love that entitlement. Territory. I love that entitlement. Yeah, and they, but, leave, they leave, left it up to other guys to go out there and slug it out. <laughs> I just kind of had to laugh at this guy. I mean. Fair play to this guy. It was 1949. Nobody had gone into space, really. Uh, so he was kind of ahead of the curve. He's like, you know, hey, I could lay claim to entire space. And then if they want to go up there and put satellites and do nuclear testing, they have to come to me first. Except yeah. nobody did. Everybody's like, no, we don't have to do I think that. What are you going to do? Nothing. Have, I think those aliens are going to have a lot to say uh, over who owns space. I know. They're going to kind of We're going to show up like, out there. And we're showing up late to the game, I guarantee you. <laughs> Oh, oh, I know. They're going to be like, wait, you guys own space? No, 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 no. Wouldn't that your be funny? Your solar system is dead in the middle of our territory. They're going to tell us like that. Yeah. We wouldn't own that, your planet. Wouldn't that be funny if, like, yeah. the Space Kingdom of Asgardia guy, and he, like, actually was able to, like, go to some other planet or something and, like, set up a thing, and then there's already aliens there being like, yeah. the fuck you think you're doing, well, these, man? These, ex, these UFOs. In my house. These UFOs that, uh, you know, that, that the Air Force sees. Yeah. That's the cops. Yeah, that's, that's the cops the, or the park rangers. You know? The planetary yeah. law enforcement. Yeah, they're like, you guys all right? Oh, man, stop fucking around. <laughs> stop fucking around. Yeah, yeah but, like, around. You know, like, you know, like I said, so so this guy, like I said, he's, he's kind of a nut, but, he, you know, he's a scientist. He's really into space, and I don't know if he's just trying to make a point or if he's, like, really serious about it or anything, but he has billions of dollars, and that's what he wants to spend it on. He's like, I wanted to put a satellite up in there. I want it to be a nation state where people can go. If they don't want to live on the Earth, they can come live on our moon colony, and it'll all be cool and all this other kind of stuff. So uh, I would like to proclaim right here on this very show that I own all the air. Yeah. So right. if you want to continue breathing, you gotta pay us. <laughs> just please ridiculous. put money into my PayPal account immediately, yeah. or I'm just gonna shut it's, off the whole planet's oxygen, and you're just, all gonna suffocate. It's just another uh, pipe dream, because yeah. you know there's gonna be corporations up there, and Earth, you know, you, the U.S., Europe, and China are gonna be on Mars and in the Moon, and they're gonna dispute over. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna fight over stuff when they get there. I don't know. I might want to live on the moon. Uh, Maybe not. A, not I don't. The moon. I don't. Would not want to go. Well, if it was a nice moon colony, I wouldn't mind Mars. I don't know if I'd want to go that far. It seems too. It seems too far away. I mean, the moon's far away too, dog. But, but you could like, actually live on Mars with the proper technology. Yeah, that's true. You could live there. Like what if you forgot desert. some of your shit back on Earth? Think of how long it would take to get back and get it. No, you'd make everything you need right what there if, on Mars. Knowing you. You would get all the way to Mars, and then you'd be like, fuck, I forgot my glasses. Yeah. And then we'll have to go all the way back. 
they'll be able to make anything. They'll be able to make anything. Because he forgets his glasses all the time. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to make anything you need right there on Mars. I would hope so. Yeah. Because like I said, I'm just, I'm not going all the way back to Earth every time. I, I bet you there's a whole bunch of uh, water underneath the surface. Underneath the surface. The, I yeah. kind of suspect there probably yeah. is too. Because then even like when they, when the little, the little guy like scraped. Yeah. I would, the, I would, the little guy, the little robot. <laughs> I would take over like a cave, seal yeah. it off, pump it full of oxygen, build down in there. That would be nice. I, I could do that yeah. probably. I could do that probably. All right. So that will do it for our news segment. You didn't do, oh, you didn't do the news song. Nah, fuck it. Missed oh, it. it's too late now. This is the news. That was the news. <laughs> that was the news. There you go. Past tense. That works. That right. was the news. <laughs> Now finish up. You're, he's to, he's committed to drinking out of this giant jar. This is how much I love pickles. We buy pickles in these big, huge fucking jars at Sam. Yeah. Well, I put them on everything. You know, they're really good. All right, so that'll do it for our news segment and our shout-outs. So now, stay tuned for our discussion about ancient aliens and the Anunnaki. Enjoy. Okay, so our main topic today is... Ancient aliens. Yeah, ancient aliens. You know where where this concept came from. It's going to involve uh, uh, Zachariah Sitchin and Eric Von Danigan and those guys, and you know what it is they actually believe, what they're saying, and and it, and if there's anything to this. Yeah, right. I mean, really, what I want to do because really the whole ancient aliens subculture, I guess you would call it, yeah. um, is so vast and it has like so many different people that I sort of wanted to just focus on Zechariah Sitchin, the Anunnaki, yeah. Nibiru, that kind of stuff. Because it's not just one thing, it's a whole scene. Right, that's and it, what I and mean. And it has evolved since it first appeared. Yeah, and then maybe like make mention of a few other little things that turned up on the ancient alien show or that, you know, yeah. or that proponents of that theory, like often talk about. Yeah. And there's weird stuff that's kind of related to the ancient aliens, uh, scene that appeared even as far back as the early 1900s, like in the 1920s to the 1950s, you know, with fake, uh, fake Indian Veda, Vedic texts about, you know, flying machines and stuff that's, yeah. that's been debunked as no, that's, that's the fifties. That's not an ancient text. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, so that's kind of related to this. I don't think we're going to get into that too much. We but might just mention it. Like, yeah, kind of well, I just end. did mention it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, I kind of wanted to mention a few other things too, okay. even though mainly I'm going to be focusing on the Anunnaki, the Sumerian. The kind Sumerian of text, that's the like Zacharias kind of Sitchin, Eric Von Danigan version right. of this. Now, the thing about the whole ancient aliens thing is that there's kind of two or three different forks of it, I guess you could call it. Now, there's the one fork that just basically says aliens came here sometime in the distant past and helped out yeah. ancient people, like, building the pyramids or teaching what have you. Teaching them how you. to build. Teaching them how to things or have, like, alien technology. And then a they, la Prometheus right. Alien Covenant. And then they which fucked is like, back you, off. Uh, yeah. There's also another uh, strain of thought which says that they came here and mingled with humans yeah, at some point in the past, you like the interbreeding. Star, you become the star child skull, you right. know what they're talking about. And uh, also, you know, the Mesoamerican Indian themes of where, yeah, they're coming down there breeding with our women. Right. You know, it says so in the Bible, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. The, and actually, the, the Anunnaki, Zachariah Sitchin, you know, thread of this. Now, he has actually proposed, now he has passed away. Uh, yeah. He he actually got, I, I thought this was very funny, but I looked on his Wikipedia page. He actually got a Lifetime Achievement Award from Coast to Coast AM. Yeah. Because well, he was on there all the time. Sure. Talking about, he wrote a shit ton of books about this. Yeah, and he sold a lot of books about it, too. And yeah, yeah. he sold millions and millions of books. Um, yeah. And they've actually been translated into like 25 languages, yeah. something like that. The, so this guy's works are very, very popular. Now, uh, let me go back a little bit to where, maybe the ancient aliens idea might have come from. Like you said, you know, there have been sort of hints of, oh, maybe, you know, ancient aliens from, you know, from the early 20th century. The idea has been around for a long time. But yeah. I think it kind of took off in the late 60s and 70s, maybe because of Carl Sagan and I.S. Schlakowski's 1966 book called Intelligent Life in the Universe. Now, in that book, they had a chapter where they kind of said, well, it's possible and maybe we should look into the possibility 
that aliens have visited humans at some point in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not impossible. It's not crazy. You know, maybe there's something to it. Now, they didn't say that there was any evidence for it. They didn't even say it was probable. They said it was possible. They just said it was possible and, and maybe didn't... we should keep an open mind. That's all they said. Yeah, and they weren't actually even talking about aliens coming here during the time of man either. They're talking about right. a pre pre-human era, you know, maybe the dinosaur age. Yeah. You know, there you know, people forget the whole concept of deep time. There's a lot of time. Yeah. The past stretches out behind us a long, long way. A lot could happen back there. And yeah, and yeah. really humans have only been a blip on the yeah, evolutionary been around for, for, time yeah, scale. Right. Have been around so for more. Carl Sagan in later years tended to think that because of him mentioning it in this book, that he kind of gave the crazier shit that came along later some legitimacy. Like yeah. he's like boosted their business. Right. Up. It's like people yeah. seem to take that idea in the late sixties and early seventies and kind of ran with it. Right. One of these people was Eric Von Daniken, uh, who very famously wrote Chariots of the Gods about how yeah. all these aliens came to Earth and gave, you know, gave ancient people their alien technology or helped them out in building things and, uh, you know, shit yeah. like that. Yeah, and we want to point out that Sitchin and Eric Von Daniken are not trained scientists or historians, really. They're or not. Archaeologists or archaeologists or anything. They, they, <laughs> they were writers, you yeah. know, and that's what they did. They wrote books. They wrote entertaining books. And because of their methods that you have to really take what they're saying is in, in a grain of salt. When Sitchin appeared on the scene, it was pre-internet. There was no real way that people in the general public could actually check these Sumerian texts for themselves at that time. Well, that time has passed. Anybody can get on the internet now. There are sites. And what was the name of that site? But if you, er, if was, you Google Sitchin it. Sitchin was wrong or Eric Von Denon is wrong, something like that. Well, or, there's one called SitchinWasWrong.com. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's run by a PhD in uh, ancient languages and ancient Near East cultures. Yeah. Um, there's also one called Ancient Aliens Debunked. Yeah. That has a bunch of links. But if you go to, there are several databases online. I think the University of Chicago has one and there might be another one where all of the ancient Sumerian text that Zechariah Sitchin was using to kind of construct his particular ancient alien theories about the Anunnaki. And yeah, stuff you can like read that, them yourself now. Where you can read them yourself because they have yeah. all been uh, translated, the ones that they found. And like I said, there's even Sumerian dictionaries. That's right. And you can even search it based upon keywords. Like you can go in there and ask for any references of the Anunnaki and it will show you in the text right where they all are. Right. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit yeah. too because there's kind of, a, I really got fascinated by this. There's a really good good documentary and it's on YouTube for free. It was made by a guy named Chris White. It's yeah, actually it's called awesome, awesome documentary. It's three hours long. Three hours and, and ten minutes long and it's fascinating. And it's very well written and very, very well done. Very entertaining. You can sit back and... Yeah, we watched the whole thing last night. Thing for, <laughs> we just sat back for, and drank and watched it yeah, for three for, hours. For three hours. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to put a link to that in the description. Yeah, uh, I'll put a link in the description so you can yeah, watch but the whole that, thing if you want. That program can do a whole lot more work than we can, given the time that we have right now. Yeah. Because they can even show you the evidence, show you everything. Yeah, I mean, because like I said, that one kind of touched on a lot of ancient aliens. Where, where it's like I said, I kind of yeah, wanted to just concentrate more on Anunnaki. Yeah, it basically Sumerian covers a generalization of the entire ancient alien scene. Yeah. Because there's a lot of them. And like I said, a lot of them are coming at it from different directions. All right. Now, Zechariah Sitchin came onto the scene in the 70s. His first book was called uh, The Twelfth Planet, and I'll explain that uh, reference in a minute. But he had a lot of, uh, he had something called the Earth Chronicles, and he wrote like a bunch of them subsequently. Basically, his whole idea was that many, many years ago, the Anunnaki, who are mentioned in Sumerian tests, and they, and they really are, yeah. but they're not what he says they are, but I'll get to that right. in a minute. Um, that these were alien beings from a planet called Nibiru, yeah. which was a traveling planet which was out beyond Neptune or out beyond Pluto yeah. and only circled through the solar system every 3,600 years or whatever. And that these Anunnaki came to Earth to mine gold yeah. because they needed uh, gold for their atmosphere. Atmosphere, for their atmosphere for whatever reason. Yeah, to deflect rays or something. Right. So these Anunnaki came to the Earth to mine gold, discovered that it was too much work, yeah. And basically genetically made humans. Yeah, it's like a slave race. As like race. a slave race. Yeah. So to mine gold for them. To mine gold for them. Yeah. 
And then there was also a whole thing, because he ties the whole thing in too with when the Anunnaki came in, they're kind of giants and then yeah. they would breed with humans and yeah. stuff. So he kind of ties it in with the biblical Nephilim story also. With yeah, like ideas giants. of titans and, and right. people on Mount Olympus and everything. Right. So it's all Olympians. kind of tied in with that. Now, yeah. where did he get these ideas from? Zechariah Sitchin claimed that he taught himself to read Sumerian cuneiform. Right. I'm not sure how true that is. I don't think he could actually read it himself. I think he read translations. He might have. Yeah. And then reinterpreted the translations. Right. And so a lot of the things that he says in his books, one, he doesn't source it or back it up or say exactly where it says that. Yeah. Shit. He'll make a claim that, oh, and it said, you know, and the Anunnaki did this and that and this and that, but he doesn't say where in the text he gets where this. Where in the text that he gets that and from. He was, and he was saying that in a time where a, a lay person could not check the text. Yeah. You could check that now. You could because go on that 70s, site and look for that. Right? In the 70s, it's not there. There, was, there was only a very small number of people, academics, who could read yeah. Sumerian cuneiform. Right. You know, and, and it's still, you know, obviously it's not something that everyone learns, but you can go and read translations right. of it now. They're we, freely available. Jenny and I, and I'm, and I'm sure many in the audience, grew up in the pre-internet age. In that era, information was hard to find. It was very hard yeah. to find. Somebody could give you a line of shit and you might believe it for a while. Even in a, you could go to a library and not find this. You could go to a library and not find translations of Sumerian texts. Yeah. But nowadays you can go online and find that. You know, it's really it speeded up research and it speeded up debunking a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, tremendously. You can do now in, in a few days what would have taken months and months back in the pre-internet age. Right. You've got to worry about mailing documents to you and then Xeroxing things and ha buying copies. And yeah, man. We used to do a whole unit in school about how to use the library for research. Yeah. And it would take a long time. Yeah. So, you know. And then your library wouldn't have the information. So you'd have to contact a far away library. It was just it And was they'd insane. have to send you the and shit. They'd have to yeah. send you the shit. Right. right. And it was like, it was shit like that. But the thing is, is that when Zechariah Sitchin's books first came out, there was basically no way for the lay person who was reading his book and enjoying it to check what he was saying was true. So here's the thing. He says in his book, without sourcing it, that the word Anunnaki translates to those who from heaven came. You're right. Now, even at the time, ancient language scholars, Sumerian scholars, were calling bullshit on that. But because there was no internet, there was no... It was you no, couldn't not get widely. your information disseminated right. to the public. So It's not what Anunnaki means. That's not what Anunnaki means. Right. The word Anunnaki basically means of royal seed or royal bloodline. Right. Anunnaki... The ones that Anu made. Right. Yeah. Are the offspring of Anu, of Anu or An, who is yeah. the great god of heaven. Yeah. And Ki, who is his consort, right. the personification of the earth, like the earth mother figure. Right. And in this same pantheon, of course, is a flood tale. And the flood tale is, it, it's basically, it's a, it's one of the other tellings of Noah's Ark and the flood. So Anu and his wife are basically El Shaddai and what was, what was the wife's name originally before they demoted to a serpent? Uh, Asherah. Asherah. In the old Hebrew stories, God also had a wife in the garden named Asherah. The, the story got rebooted and re-edited to where Asherah was demoted to a serpent for helping out Adam and Eve. Okay, well, El Shaddai also had sons. One of those sons was Yahweh. Another one of those sons was Baal. All right, Yahweh chose Israel. So basically, when you have in the Sumerian text that uh, the Anunnaki were the ones that Anu made and, and his wife, what they're talking about is the sons of God. In other words, the Anunnaki were angels. Because actually, in the Hebrew pantheon, Yahweh would have been one of God's sons originally, who Yahweh originally was an angel. Okay, the same with uh, the other ones that chose the other Hebrew tribes. Later, as cult of Yahweh gets bigger, Yahweh and El Shaddai get merged, and it says Yahweh is God, and and that you know, and then all then his brothers all get demoted to angels. It's a system that ancient religions is just the way ancient religions did things. It's the way they wrote things. That's 
you know, that's what I mean. It's like the more you learn about the Sumerian, you know, creation myths and things like that. Yeah. I don't know why Sitchin latched onto the Sumerian myth and making it sound like aliens because it's really not that different. It's not that different from Old Testament. From the Old Testament. Yeah. It's not that different from, you know, any of the other uh, Greek creation pan- myths. Greek, or Greek pantheons, yeah, same the, the Egyptian thing. pantheons. It's that same pantheon system. And basically all it is is they are personifying forces of nature yeah. or celestial bodies yeah. as gods, which yeah. is something that most ancient cultures did. Yeah, one of the one of the things that's different between uh, the Sumerian pantheon and the Hebrew pantheon is that according to most of the people that really have studied it extensively, the Sumerian pantheon is not quite as exciting. It's kind of boring. Yeah, uh, the, the the stuff that they have. Now I'll tell you one thing is that. The Sumerian version of the flood, called you know the Epic of Gilgamesh, is far better written than Genesis, than the yeah. Genesis flood story. It's longer and it's more descriptive. It's pretty cool. In a way, the Genesis flood version of that story is kind of the hillbilly version. It's very stripped down and kind of simple. Yeah, I read, yeah. we actually uh, read that in my humanities class when I was in college. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of something something that's um, that has always been really interested, interesting to me, like the older versions of the Old Testament flood story. But yeah, yeah. so what you're seeing here is Zechariah Sitchin, basically he wanted to come to the conclusion, or he came to the conclusion first, that these Anunnaki... The Sumerians were actually talking about aliens. So then he sort of went through a lot of the Sumerian writings, like the Enuma Elish and all that, those types of things, and kind of made it so that it seemed like these Anunnaki were coming down from space. Yeah. His translations... No Sumerian scholar agrees with the translations that he has made. He's got an objective in his mind when he's right. t- telling you this story, and he's tweaking what he knows of the Sumerian text to make it really read that way, or read more like that way. But some of that stuff he's just making up out of whole cloth. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, why on earth would he have... Why would he say in all his writings that Anunnaki means those from the heavens came? Like it may, So it would make it sound like they were coming from outer space, like they yeah. were aliens. But that's not what that word means. And it's nowhere in the text. And in, it's in the nowhere story. in that. And nowhere in the stories is it, is it like that. Right. It's no different than any other, in, any other stories of angels, uh, in the Old Testament stories about angels. And he also says, too, they actually said this on an episode of Ancient Aliens, like word for word, they said this. They said... That in the Sumerian text, it says that the Anunnaki came down from the sky in flying vehicles. And that is complete bullshit. It never says that. Mm -hmm. And you can search the entire, everything they've translated of Sumerian and nothing ever says that. And Mm -hmm. the thing that Ancient Aliens, the show, used to illustrate these so-called winged vehicles yeah. was like, it was basically, it was this frieze that had um, some carvings on it, like a relief. And in the top of it, there was like a little disc with little wings on it. It looks just like the Egyptian solar disc. Well, that's what it is. It's what it's it is. It's the Sumerian solar disc. And, and the Egyptians ripped that off from the Sumerians, which is a round disc with big, elegant wings that with come, wings out, on come it. out the side. Because the sun is in the sky, it's moving, so therefore it's flying. So therefore it's it has wings It's gotta have wings. wings. That gives you the idea that it moves, you know? Yeah. And the thing that they don't show you, too, and I kind of want to get into this in a little bit as well, is that I think that a lot of this ancient alien stuff that they put on the TV show and that they put in the books and stuff, what they'll do is they'll take shit out of context. Yeah. So, like, I find it instructive that the ancient alien TV show, when they wanted to make you believe that the Anunnaki, the the Sumerian text said that the Anunnaki came down in flying vehicles, they showed a freeze that had this little disc with wings on it, and that was all it had. They didn't show you the many, many, many other freezes that has that exact same artwork on it, that it has, like, it's a little disc over here with wings, and then on the other side is a moon. It's obviously the sun and And the the moon. And the moon, right, yeah. And when you see the other freezes, that becomes very obvious to you that it's like, oh, that's the sun and that's the moon. But see, they didn't want you to know that, so they didn't show you that. Right. And we we were watching that same program that explains why even in the middle or in the medieval era, the sun and the moon had faces in them. Yeah. Because in during Roman times they had faces in them. That's the way their cults uh drew yeah. the sun and the moon. Because in pre cultic Roman cultic times, the sun and the moon were gods and goddesses, so they're kind of personifying them as beings in, in, in the heavens. Sun and the moon. Yeah. They have faces. 
<laughs> right. And I think that, and I was going to say that too, is that another thing, and this isn't so much a Zechariah Sitchin thing, but this is just a general ancient aliens thing, is that they will often point to a couple of medieval Byzantine era paintings and go, look, it, it's, uh, you know, back in the sky behind the Virgin Mary, there's there's a spacecraft back there. Yeah. It's a UFO. And they're but, only showing you one of them. But they're only showing you one of them. Yeah. If they showed you other examples of paintings from that era that were yeah. of the same biblical passage, yeah. you would very quickly see that that is not a UFO that they're It's either the painting. sun or the moon, yeah. It's clouds. Yeah, or the faces of angels. Or yeah. with an angel popping out, yeah. or with sun rays coming out of it, or with a ring yeah. of angels, which was yeah. a way that a lot of medieval painters portrayed the spirit of God and they had like me coming go- down from heaven. They had me going with one painting. They have a thing that looks like an arrowhead with a man sitting in it. Yeah. But if you look real closely, there's a crescent back on it. It's the moon. It's the moon. It's the moon. And, yeah. and when, when you then they show you other paintings of... How yeah, there are lots of them. Lots and lots of paintings of how the medievals painted the moon and the sun. And yeah, there's always a man's face, a crescent. It's moving. It's and then flying. they yeah, they put like a little they, arrowy arrows thing on to make it make it to look, make it look, like, look like it's, it's moving because it yeah. moves across it the moves sky. Across the sky. Yeah. So that's how they demonstrated that in the Middle Ages. Yeah. That was the symbolism. It seems like you know it shows like ancient aliens will always show you the one or two paintings where this little cloud of angels isn't very clear or it's like, you know, kind of a shitty looking quality yeah. or something. So it's like, oh, look, it could be an alien. Or look, yeah. it's it's shooting a laser beam into, uh, yeah. the, vir- into In Mary. the Virgin Mary. Well, that's because it's impregnating that's, Virgin yeah, Mary. That's, that's symbolic what they're of impregnating about. God right. impregnating Mary. That's what that, that's all that yeah, is. Yeah, a little dove flying down towards Mary's belly yeah. on a laser beam. Yeah, and there's yeah. a bunch of paintings like Bunches that. Bunches of them. You know, it, it seems very deceptive the way they go about things, and they're yeah. really leaving a lot of context out, you know, that would explain a lot yeah. of these quote-unquote anomalies that turn up in this kind of thing. Yeah, and this stuff goes across cultures because they're doing the same thing with Mesoamerican stuff. The Mesoamerican, like Incan and Aztec, their language was like a system of little faces and pictures. They weren't even really like Chinese pictograms or hieroglyphs. They were a lot cooler, and the way it was, they were like emojis. A language based on emojis. It could either represent a consonant or a syllable. The, the first sound that that emoji means, like fish might, like a picture of a fish might be, or whatever you know yeah. their language was for that. Or it might mean fish itself, and then they would turn it around backwards and do all these weird things with it. it kind of like you would online playing games with emojis, like reversing them. Well, because of that weird language, the way it looked, you know, back before they knew what it said, it gave them a lot of leeway to go, oh, this is, has something to do with aliens. And then some of the statues from some of the tribes that they had were basically really kawaii statues, like, you know, like cute Japanese stuff. Yeah. And one of the famous ones is this thing that looks like a damn airplane. But they're only showing you that thing that looks like an airplane. They're not showing you the other stuff that it came with, salamanders and lizards and you can see that there's a style, like this kawaii style to these little yeah, figurines that they made. stylized animals. You and, and they were all animals that were important to these Mesoamericans. If you take that one that looks like an airplane, you can put it right next to a sucker fish, and that's what it is. They had this little sucker fish with the eyes on the top, and its fins look like wings, and it looks like a little jet. The, the, the fish looks like a little jet. Right. And that's what that little plane is. It's not a yeah. plane. It's, 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 like it's, it's I said, a fish. And I think that happens with a lot of these kind of out-of-place artifacts, like you said. And like I said, they will take one thing that yeah. looks weird. And show you that. And show you that, but not show you the hundreds of other... Things that don't look weird. Things that don't look weird. They're little cutesy statues of lizards. Little and, frogs and, and frogs birds. And, and, yeah. Right. Shit like that. But that, I'll tell you what, the reason why that little statue looks like a jet is because the fish, the fish looks like a jet. looks like a jet. When you put a picture of the fish right next to it, you go, oh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. It's in that style. It's very obvious that that's what it is when you yep. see a photo of the fish that they were depicting. Yeah, it's a little flattened out sucker fish, kind of shark shaped with fins that look like wings. With a little big round De- head. It was a delta wing shaped fish. Yeah. yeah just like a delta yeah. wing jet. And it's like I said, it's very obvious when you see the real thing that it was based upon. So yeah. I don't, so I don't think there's anything to explain there. Right. So let's um, take a break right now because we're about at the halfway point. And then we get back. I want to talk a little bit, a bit more about Anunnaki. I want to talk about Nibiru. Yeah. And uh, maybe what that t- stuff really says. And uh, maybe talk some more about some other stuff that people said about building projects that the aliens yeah. helped with and stuff like uh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll that. get to that in a minute. We will be back in just a few minutes.
everybody. Jenny's got some new shirt designs up, four of them. Really good ones, too. Atlanta Ripper, Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm, the H.H. Holmes Murder Castle, and, of course, Demon Child, because man said he could. These are updated designs. I think they look really cool. Jenny did a great job on them. Were they fun making, Jenny? They were very fun, and thank you very much. I think they came out very good. Yeah, they get really good. They're very high-quality shirts. Jenny and I wear shirt, uh, our own shirts at, at certain times when we're trying to put a spotlight on ourselves, and you can put a spotlight on yourselves. If you go ahead and pick up one of these shirts today, you guys are going to love them. Links in the description, www.zazzle.com at 13 o'clock. Yeah, so go check out our store at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We got these four cool new t-shirt designs plus all our old ones if you'd rather get one of the old ones. But these ones are awesome and you should check them out. They're also available in women's cut and they look really cute. Jenny's got some. So thank you. Go check them out. Now, one of the other very funny things yeah. that they mentioned on this documentary, and like I said, they love this shit on Ancient Aliens. And even when I was doing a Google search for Anunnaki, these carvings and reliefs mm. kept coming up. And I'll put them in the YouTube video so you can see what they look like. They're usually like these big guys and they have like helmets or turbans, it yeah. looks like. It looks like they have wristwatches on. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? In, and they have wings and shit like that. So yeah. ancient aliens, and I think Zechariah Sitchin was kind of pointing out, it's like, oh, look, these are obviously spacemen or right. whatever. Yeah, and before well, before we get into this too much, though, I want to say something. Just because we are we don't really believe in the, in the evidence that they're showing us for this ancient aliens, and I think we have good reasons why we don't believe in that, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, that doesn't mean that I don't believe in extraterrestrials. Well, I, it's I, a different question. It's, it's a very different question. Actually, I do believe in extraterrestrials, and I do think that some of these sightings that military police and airline pilots have had in the past not all of them are easily dismissed you know there's there's like secondary evidence of like radar signatures and uh, more than one witness at a time so is it possible that ancient people may have seen mysterious things in the sky oh hell yeah you sure know? it's possible sure and uh, you know you have meteors you have you know falling stars you know every anything that they saw that they couldn't explain was something mysterious could they have seen an extraterrestrial craft in the sky like something out of, uh, you know, Phoenix Lights? Yeah, they could have. We weren't there. We don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. The evidence that these guys are presenting in this ancient alien scene, the evidence is not good. They're, mis they're, they're forcing this evidence to fit this theory. And we're going to talk more about this evidence. Yeah, and like I said, nothing that they're showing is really all that compelling. No. And they all have completely normal, rational explanations. Right. So I don't think that... You need to posit yeah. an extraterrestrial intelligence. And another, another thing is, is that if extraterrestrials came here, it wouldn't leave behind any physical evidence. It would be just like today when there's a cop sitting in a car and he sees a triangle fly over his vehicle that kills. You know what I mean? He's just going to report back and says, man, I saw a UFO. But that's it. Yeah. There's not going to be hard evidence afterwards. Right. The ancients may have seen things like that, but they wouldn't have any hard evidence. Well, they wouldn't. There wouldn't be any way of knowing. There wouldn't be any way of knowing whether or not they right. saw it or not. There wouldn't be. They would have no way of knowing whether whether it was extraterrestrial or not, and they'd have no way to really give us a reliable message throughout time. That you know, I mean, they wouldn't be able to leave anything behind to let us know because no matter what they draw, we could interpret it as something else. Well, yeah, and I think that's kind of the problem with a lot of this stuff. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I don't know if Zechariah Sitchin necessarily thought that he was bullshitting or if he actually did believe this stuff. I, but it does seem like a lot of them use selective yeah. editing if, if and like me, selective showing of evidence and like leaving important things out. If you ask me, Sitchin and Danikin, they said they saw this idea and they go, yeah, extraterrestrials may, could have come here in the past. There'd be no way of knowing. All right. So let's go ahead and find some of these weird anomalies in the past 
and say, well, there's the evidence because it'll make a good book. These are writers, okay? A writer wants to write a book and sell a book. Nowadays, it's easy to disprove the evidence that they're showing. Yeah. You know what I mean? You could say, no, that's not what that is. That's not a helicopter. You know, that's a hieroglyph that's broken apart. It's just yeah. stuff like that, you know? I think they knew they were writing fiction. It was, you know, cool fiction. Or they had convinced themselves, or they had so convinced themselves that ancient aliens thing was true yeah. that they just went looking for shit that would prove it and anything that wouldn't prove it or would disprove it, they just ignored it. Eric Which von is something Danigan, that a lot of people do. Eric Von Danigan may have convinced himself. He sounds like he believes it. That's what I mean. If yeah. you can convince yourself, then it's easier to convince others because yeah. you actually believe it. And I think if you swallow your own bullshit long enough, I think eventually you will believe yeah, it. Yeah, I think I think Sitchin knew he was kind of... I wouldn't call it a hoax. I think he... He was. He knew he was writing a book. He knew he was, yeah. he was writing a book that would sell. I mean, he must have known that uh, he was not... A Sumerian scholar. Exactly. And I, he must have known that he wasn't really faithfully translating. Yeah, because his... some of his shit's way yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. That's way off. Yeah. I, I, yeah. He, he, was, he, was, he was trolling. And here's another thing, too. Like I said, if you go right now and Google Anunnaki, probably one of the most or two of the most famous images that come up are these two, like, quote unquote, Sumerian reliefs that look like winged dudes. And one of them kind of has a bird head or something. And they have these little things in their hands where they're like pointing at shit. And it's a pine comb. And they, well, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to that. Yeah. And uh, they look like they have wristwatches on and shit like that. Now, the problem about these is one... They're not Sumerian. They're yeah, Akkadian. Akkadian. Yeah. Two, they don't have anything to do with the Anunnaki. They're not Anunnaki. That's not what they are. No, they're genie. What they are is yeah. they are essentially fertility genies. Yeah. And you can see this when it's explained, when the iconography is explained to. It's a very yeah. common iconography. The little quote unquote wristwatches they're wearing, they usually have them on both wrists and sometimes they have them on like headbands too. Yeah. It basically looks like a little daisy. Yeah. And what that is, is that is the symbol of the goddess Ishtar, who is right. the fertility goddess. Right. They're like, even on the Ishtar gate in Babylon, you know, you can see these little daisy looking yeah. rosette patterns. Also the queen of heaven. Yeah. yeah. And that's her thing. So what these genies are is they're basically, they're fertilizing, the, the things they're holding in their hands are either a male date flower or a pine cone. Yeah. And they're always pointing them at a date tree, which is a sign of fertility. Yeah. And sometimes there's the king in there and shit. So it's basically a fertility picture is yeah. basically what it is. So it doesn't have anything to do with Anunnaki. It doesn't have anything to do with that. And they said the reason that they have wings is because the ancient people saw that flowers and plants were fertilized by birds and yeah. bees. So obviously these genies that represented fertility would also have wings. So that's all it is. These are not spacemen. They're not, they're not helmets. There's nothing like that. They're not wristwatches that they're wearing. It's just, that was their little outfit. They're just little genies. They're fertilizing day trees. A lot, of people, a lot of people like to modernize what ancient cultures are giving us. You know what I mean? Like this, well, it's got wings. They mean, you know, you know, it's gotta be an alien. No, it's just a man with wings. It's a genie. Yeah. You know, their their thinking was was very different from ours, you know. Nobody like, says Mercury like the god like the Roman god Mercury was an alien even yeah, though he had wings. Exactly. <laughs> Which like, I always thought was a dumb. Good one is like Why in, everybody pick on the Sumerians? In Ezekiel, you know, there's a there's a there's a passage little tale there that every some of the ancient alien guys want to say is a description of a UFO. Ezekiel's is, wheel, yeah. Yeah, Ezekiel's wheel. And if you really look at look at what it is that they're talking about and the icon the, the the icons that they used back in those days. Days. That's that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about God's throne. Yeah, it's a big chair. Right. It's got wheels on it. It's got wings, and it's got faces of animals. I mean, and it's got four corners. Uh, it the reason why it has wings is because they're saying it flies. Yeah. If it's got wings, it flies. Yeah, like a bird. A wheel. If it if wheels roll, so that means it can roll across the ground like a carriage. All right. A wheel within a wheel means it can roll fast. Because yeah. if you got a wheel and it rolls, make that wheel roll inside another wheel, it'd be rolling even it'll faster. Go twice as it'll fast. go even faster. That's what they're talking about. <laughs> and if you were to actually, Sounds legit. yeah, and if you were to actually see the thrones that King sat on in the days of that writing, you'll see exactly what they're talking about. They yeah. had wings carved on them and faces carved on them and animals. And because you know your throne was pimping, yeah, your throne could fly, your throne could roll as a car and an airplane. <laughs> You know, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. And it shoots lightning. You well, know? like I said, 
the ancient people, what they did, and people still do it nowadays. Yeah. And, you know, people back then were really, their brains were no different than ours. What they do is they tend to personify or exaggerate yeah. things that they know. Right. You know, whether this was celestial bodies, whether it was the passing of the seasons, whether it was chariots, yeah. when they were talking about gods, then they would just take something that they knew, like a chariot yeah. or a throne, and just pimp it out. Yeah, because like, you know, obviously it would be... I'm rich. I got an airplane. Right. But my airplane's got jets and rockets, and it shoots laser beams. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that, you exactly... Know, that's, that's what exactly, they're talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. And now, I want to talk a little bit about Nibiru, because this is another thing where... Sitchin's translation of this is just totally, totally off. Mm -hmm. Now, for whatever reason, and I think it was just because he got the idea from this one little clay cylinder that's Sumerian that actually kind of shows it's like a big dot with like a bunch of other little dots around it. Now, from this, Zachariah Sitchin extrapolated that the Sumerians thought that there were or knew about another planet, a 12th planet that was out beyond Pluto that would kind of circle around into the solar system. And uh, this planet has also been called Planet X. So this planet Nibiru was supposedly where the Anunnaki came from. Now, he really reached to get Nibiru being a planet. Now, the word Nibiru does turn up in some of the Sumerian texts, but it's not referring exactly to what he thinks it's referring to. When it refers to a planet, it's actually referring to Jupiter because Jupiter is the celestial body that was associated with the god Marduk. Marduk, yeah. So Marduk and Jupiter yeah. are the same thing. Oh, it's, okay, yeah, it's exactly the same thing in the, uh, in the uh, Roman religions. Jupiter was god. Right. Yeah, king of the gods. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Same as Zeus. Right. So oh, yeah. when Nibiru is used to... So you see, they, these, these it's, it's fucking awesome how all these pantheons are all ripoffs and reboots of one another. Yeah. God is always Jupiter. Yeah. <laughs> so Nibiru, when it appears in the text, it either means Jupiter Marduk. Yeah. It means a star associated with Jupiter. Yeah. Or... Sometimes it means uh, something that's like a crossing point or an intersection or a gateway. Uh, it can mean that too. But it never ever means a planet that's outside of the... Because the Sumerians... It's and, in, the, in the solar system. It's never outside the right, solar system. And right. The, the Sumerians only knew of five planets and the moon and the sun. This is attested to in all of their other texts. They never mention any other planets than that. Right. They knew about the five main ones that you can see with the naked eye and the sun and the moon. That was it. Right. There was no thing about... No telescopes. No telescopes. They didn't yeah. think there were 11 planets, plus Nibiru was the 12th one right. that came circling around and all this other shit. I think that Sitchin got that idea because of the quote-unquote battle between Marduk and Tiamat yeah. and how it... You know, how he was saying, oh, this was an actual alien battle. This was how the Earth was formed. And then right. Tiamat was a was another planet that got broken up and became the asteroid belt right. and stuff like that. But which, you know, it's not a crazy thing because planets do hit each other. But he's kind of saying that this happened in within human memory. Yeah. And that is not the case. Now, also, the, the Tiamat was a, was a cosmic space dragon that Marduk fights and tears her body apart. And her body is used to create the Earth or the universe. I think it's just the Earth. Yeah. But Tiamat is a dragon. Tiamat also makes an appearance in the New Testament. What they're talking about in Revelations at the end of time when Jesus comes back, throwing the Antichrist and the dragon into the abyss is basically a way of... of of describing uncreation, in other words, uncreating the earth, because all that is passed away and everyone's going to live forever in Eden. That's how I understood that story. Yeah, I think the problem is that a lot of people, particularly if you're already of the bent where you want to believe the ancient alien type of thing, I think people have a tendency to think that ancient peoples, well, all of these stories had to be based on something that actually happened, as though... People back then didn't have imaginations or yeah. couldn't speak metaphorically or which is kind of insulting to them, I yeah. think. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's not like everything had to be based on a real thing. No, they were, some of these were just concepts. They were like, they were like right. memes, like, like Tiamat. Tiamat was a meme. It was a dragon. Yeah. It was a cosmic space dragon. Yeah. That was a bad thing. And Marduk 
disassembles her to make the earth. But through that action, he becomes God. He achieves the title of God because he wasn't God at first. He got promoted to God. Right. God was a job title. Yeah. <laughs> it's like king Take of this the this job and Well, it's always it. that way, you know. Jupiter became God because he overthrew Saturn. You know, when, when right. the same thing is... You know, Zeus became God when he overthrew his father, Kronos. So he took the job title of God. Yeah. Like general. General of heaven. Yeah, like I said, they're basically just extrapolating right. human things, the human things that they knew, and just making them bigger and, like, more yeah. cosmic and, like, applying it yeah. to the entire the same universe thing at large. In, the same things happens, basically, in the in the Hebrew pantheon. El Shaddai is God, but in time, Yahweh becomes God. Yeah, they become fused. Like, he ascends to that title. Right. As cult of Yahweh takes over Judaism, at least in certain circles, Yahweh is promoted to God. And that's explained in Exodus where, you know, where the burning bush tells Mo Moses, you know, I'm El Shaddai, you know, you're, and you know, I'm Yahweh, you know, your Lord Baal, because Baal's in the original translation too, the one that your ancestor Abraham called El Shaddai. Yeah, so it's... So God was just a job title. That It changed. It's like a kingly progression. It's like a kingly is progression. what they're talking right. about. Yeah. And since we kind of talked about, um, you know, we're kind of getting to the end of the show, but yeah. since we were kind of talking about how insulting it was that ancient people didn't have any imaginations or that they couldn't come up with, like, these cool imaginative stories, let's talk a tiny bit about this whole thing where aliens supposedly helped build pyramids or Puma Punku or mm. some other like oh, yeah. supposedly Google archaeological would, sites that a, somehow ancient people couldn't have figured out how to build a good them. One, so a good aliens. one would be the pyramids. Why don't we start with the pyramids? Yeah, I mean this is kind of a common one, so um, I don't I don't know if everyone is really familiar with the work that that French architect did on well, the Well that's some yeah, that's been around for a while. I think it first came out in 2010, 2011, yeah, something that's about like when that. It, I, I found it in about two twelve. There's a bunch of documentaries about it, but yeah, um and if you, you got his see name's the, uh Houdin, I think. I think it is Houdin. Yeah. You got you got to see his work because he lays out how that pyramid was made and the construction process. And they have a little animation of it happening in fast forward and fast motion. And when you see it, you go, oh, well, of course. That's how I can't it. believe nobody came up with it before now yeah. because once you yeah. see it, seriously, when I saw this documentary years ago, they did it the easiest way they could. Yeah, I was like watching <laughs> it, going, "Duh!" I can't yeah. believe nobody thought of that before. Yeah. You know what they I mean? Did. It just seemed like the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Well, yeah. not easy because it's still like a lot of work. It but... was just a, a it was just a monument to human organization. Yeah. Like it was a highly organized, highly trained group of men working together that and that knew exactly how to deal with stone and how to move stone. And, well, it, and it really was once you have the plan and the whole thing was re rehearsed with little blocks you yeah know, little models because you would make over, models and stuff model, just like yeah, they do now and, and once you kind of had a plan and you put that plan into action they said that you they were putting a uh what was it one stone would be in place every 15 minutes construction yeah. time really would have only been about seven to nine years and, because they cut yeah. everything beforehand like yeah. they had everything cut they to placed spec. orders in the quarries right. for each one of those rocks and they all ar arrived on the sites at the right time and they're leaving a space inside the pyramid Basically, there was there was a subway tunnel yeah. inside the pyramid itself with, that with they filled of, up. That they made, yeah. like inside, it wasn't a train, obviously, but it was like a wooden sled. Tracks. It was wooden, wooden tracks, tracks with yeah. like a sleds that slid along so you could slide the stones. Yeah. And they, they would pull them up. They would hoist them up. And there were guy, also guys inside inside the uh, the subway, that's the subway right. tunnel, with big ro big wooden rods. And they're using them as levers to lever the damn things up yeah. the tracks too, which is exactly the way the Greeks said it was done. It was done with levers. Also guys pushing and also guys pu pulling and then guys on either side of the tracks using wooden beams to, to kind of lever the sled. Right. Not the rock, the sled. Up the track. In a way, like I said, I think the whole ancient aliens thing, that aliens had to come here and help out these poor, dumb, ancient people who didn't know how to do anything, that to me is really, it's kind of offensive because yeah, these very you're kind of shitting on yeah. these ancient people's ingenuity they and were creativity. Genius. Yeah. I mean, the shit they came up with, it's still standing there. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, how much shit you build now is yeah. still going to be standing there 3,000 years from now. Those ancient civilizations were not democracies. They weren't uh, liberal democracies that you find today. They were some kind of a uh, theocracy. Uh, and they were also kind of a dictatorship run by, or a monarchy run by a king. And systems like that have a certain advantages. And one of the advantages is, is that if the king wants something done, it's done. And they can allocate all the 
their resources and all their people right to where they want them. So you don't need to have a real high average IQ amongst your population. But if you have one genius with 150 IQ and you're the king, you're going to put that guy right where you want him and tell everyone to listen to him and to do it. And that's kind of the way these uh, construction of the pyramids w was all about. Yeah. And it like was a highly top-down, almost a military-style organization. You know, that's how they did that. And I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about Pumapunku, too, because this is notable for being... It's in Bolivia. It's, it's notable for being the only place, according to the Ancient Aliens TV show, that was entirely built by extraterrestrials. And this was another thing where, on Ancient Aliens, first of all, they straight up lied. They said that the rocks that Pumapunku were made of we're granite. Yeah, no. They're, yeah. Which they're not. Right. They're sandstone. Right. Which is much easier to work with. It's much right. softer than granite. And it, not like you can't make things with granite because the Egyptians did. And uh, you can cut granite with fucking copper saws and sand. Yeah, right? and, yeah, and they, yeah, they, they make the big thing out of, well, this is stone. Stone is very easy to work with. People have been working, working it yeah. for thousands and thousands of years. What do you think the Stone Age was about? Right. It's like, yeah. you know, we know how to do that shit. That's right. Just two guys with a copper saw as dull as a butter knife and a handful of sand can cut a huge stone can block. Can cut granite. Right. You can do it. Dudes, go on Easily. YouTube right now. You'll see guys doing it. And you can see guys. The yeah. saw doesn't even have to have teeth on it. Nope. You just need sand. In fact, if it had sand. teeth on it, it probably wouldn't work. It probably wouldn't work as It good. just has to be flat. But yeah, so the thing like about... The back, like the back side of a butter knife. Yeah. It wasn't even very thin. It was probably about, what, four millimeters wide? Yeah. But the thing about Pumapunku that they were talking about, one, it's not made of granite, it's made of sandstone. Two, they're saying, oh, these blocks, they were too heavy. The Indians that built them didn't have writing, which they didn't, but they had pictographs. And it's like, you know, if they could draw a picture of shit, then yeah, yeah. they could do it. You know, it's like, how would they have made all these really square, you know, shapes and stuff. If they didn't have metal chisels, they did have metal chisels. Yeah. They could make alloys. They made yeah. alloys with copper and they knew to put arsenic in it. Yeah. Even on the fucking site yeah. of the ruin. And they yeah. didn't show this on Ancient Aliens, but yeah. if you pan the camera over a little bit, yeah. there are actually, you can see stone molds yeah. for or, chisels and yeah. hammers and stuff like that no, that they made be, out of metal. You had to be a bad man, too, to do this because, you know, I work with tools. You know, I have my own garage here building motorcycles. If you have to make your own tools, you're a man there to do that. Okay? I know, right? These they were guys, making them on site. Th these guys could, around a campfire, have a bunch of rocks, all right, and just starting off with rocks... From that, make stone me, stone working tools out yeah. of metal alloys, all mixed by hand. So that was like the equivalent of nuclear physicists, you know, and you know right. these guys doing that. Because you know, all they did, they did the same thing. Imagine that every... how valuable you would be to your people right. if you could sit there and make. Out metal alloy tools out of rocks and a fire and do it just on a regular basis. But and that, look, that's exactly and, what they did. And then they show you that tool, photographs of what those tools look like. It looked like something I pulled out of my toolbox. Yeah, yeah. it just looks like a chisel. Like it looks a chisel. like a metal chisel. Yeah. That's what I mean. It, it, it just kills me that they would have you believe that these ancient people who lived for thousands and thousands of years and like you said, had been working, I mean, you know, the human race has been working with stones and things like that for yeah. even longer than that. And to think that people back then didn't know how to use things in their environment didn't know how to work with things we live in an era where you get it you go into the mcdonald's drive through and you get a coke all right and you drink it and then you throw that into the wastebasket and drive yeah. home and never know how anything works all right yeah. these guys here had pride in workmanship and craftsmanship they had a lot of time on their hands right and they were very proud of what they were doing that was how they got their status in society was to make something perfectly flat to put a really good edge on something and look it's totally square a lot of times when you look at the stuff it does it looks perfect it looks very square now if you take a carpenter square and put it on it's off a little it's bit. off a little bit it's off a little bit if it was done by an aliens and lasers it would be perfectly square it's not perfect it's just close enough you can't yeah. tell the human eye and a lot of the stuff that the greeks made even too they realized that you didn't want things perfectly square the, the building would kind of look small if you did that. If you kind of bent the angles in a little bit, you could get what's called forced perspective yeah. to make it look even bigger than it was. Yeah. So they, they, knew, they knew exactly what they were doing. 
And the thing, too, is that, I mean, there were a couple of other examples that they gave on ancient yeah. aliens where they were trying to argue that, you know, the ancient Romans, for example, didn't know how to lift really heavy pieces of stone and stuff. I'm like, they had cranes, they had cranes. and pulleys yeah. and things like that. They weren't dumb. Yeah, it's like they knew how to do that shit. And they said that that crane had a six ton lifting capacity, but they could use like they, 20 of yeah, them. Yeah, you could use you a could, whole bunch of them to, in to, synchrony and, so yeah, you could lift really things up. To move really big stuff. They knew exactly... They were moving gigantic stuff with no technology in Russia in the 1700s. 1700s, they moved this gigantic, colossal stone, just basically using Russian peasants and some rope. You know? I mean, all you need is weight and counterweight. If you and understand, yeah. yeah, if you understand those principles, which have been the same forever, yeah. then you can move heavy shit yeah. with not that many people. You would be surprised how few people you need. Yeah. And they said the same thing, you know, and this kind of pissed me off too. They said the same thing about. Pumu Punku, they were saying, oh, well, these stones, they're kind of, they're, they kind of look like H's, actually. And he's like, oh, well, they couldn't have moved them, so aliens must have levitated them, which, right. okay, that escalated quickly. But what they didn't tell you was that the tops of all those stones mm -hmm. had, like, holes in them, and mm -hmm. these holes were for ropes. You put yeah. rope down in the one... It was making a handle on it, essentially. Yeah. So you were making rope handles, but they didn't tell you that on the show. Yeah. But every single rock had that. Yeah, they're, they're not smart enough to move those big stones and move those big Easter Island heads. Well... Damn, dumb guy like me is awful smart because I can tell you what, I can't move the, uh, a damn filing cabinet by myself when it's totally full. But I do know that if I tip it on its side and then I walk it from one corner, you, yeah, I can move rock it, it back and rock it back and forth and walk it down the other side of the house without breaking a sweat. And as dumb as I am, they couldn't figure that out. <laughs> And you can do. And you Why can can't do a it smart person the, realize? You can that, do it on the on the Moai too. Yeah, they, do it they've on done Moai. it. That's right. And actually, the, dumb people are smarter than they look. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they showed a little clip of this too, and it, this might be on YouTube. But there's a guy who decided that he was going to build a replica of Stonehenge in his backyard all yeah. by himself, not using any modern tools or anything. Yeah, yeah. So he's it. basically using levers and wood. Yeah. To make Stonehenge, and he's doing it by himself, by himself just by using weight counterweight. Yeah. And he had this gigantic stone weighs tons. And he's running from one side to the next, rocking it back and forth. Yep. And then somebody underneath there just slipping pieces of wood. And then he just wood. slips pieces of wood slipping, in there. Yeah, and it rocks. As a brace. It, and it raises and raises every time it rocks. It yeah. goes up. It takes a long time. It takes a long time, but, you, but, but one, man, one, can, one man can do it. lifting and that 30-ton rock. And that's what he was trying rock. to show. That's what right. he was trying to show, that it doesn't take... And the thing is, in ancient Egypt at Pumu Punku in Bolivia, it's like you didn't, ha it wasn't one man. It was hundreds of people. Right, so you could get a lot of work so done. So you could get a lot of work done. I mean, it wasn't that big a deal. And they were organized. They had sure. teams just like nowadays. And when you have a highly experienced, highly trained team of men that knew exactly what they were doing, they could really get, they could really get rocking. Yeah. And get construction working fast. Yeah. You know, and get it done. And that's what they did. So like I said, it's not terribly And they were shocking, proud of what they did, you know, and they'd sit back and relax and drink or whatever, you know, bring me the women. You know, that kind of <laughs> stuff, you know what I mean? That's the way they were. Feed me the grapes. Yeah, feed yeah, me the so grapes. So like I said, it's I'm not saying that it's impossible that aliens, you know, aliens could have visited yeah. at some point in the past, but I don't think it's necessary to posit that to explain these quote unquote anomalies or these architectural marvels or whatever, yeah. because I think humans were perfectly capable of doing that. Right. We have, you know, X, Y, Z, this is how they did it. I don't think you need to say that there were aliens involved. It's just right. not a necessary component of that people, story. People see things, reliable people see things today that can't be explained. I think they're extraterrestrial. I don't know if they're spacecraft or some kind of weird energy probe or something. Maybe it's a dimension door looking at us from another dimension. There's no way of knowing that yet. All right. But I think there are some things that you just can't easily explain away. Even Michio Kaku said that. So yeah. you can't explain all this away. But we know that this happens, but there's no physical evidence left behind. Just stories. There's a chance that that could have been happening thousands of years ago. Sure. But there have been no physical evidence left behind. Yeah. Just stories. If it did happen, then that's and all the, that remains. And over time, the stories would have been forgotten right. or misinterpreted. So, yeah, there could have been ancient aliens, but nothing of those occurrences could have survived time. It's too long ago. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, like I said, right. it's it's two different things. I'm not saying that aliens didn't visit. I'm just saying the, the evidence they're the showing, evidence they're showing is, bu it. is bullshit, and yeah. that's not that's what that says. It's a good story, though. It's a good story, bro. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and people should, people should actually read those books and listen to those stories just for the entertainment of yeah. them. There are good stories, and they're good examples of yeah, yeah. That's a good idea, but yeah, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> that's not what happened. But that's you know, happened, cool right. story, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, 
Uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed this rather brief and rambling discussion of the Anunnaki and various other ancient astronauts and ancient aliens theories. Remember, if you like the show, to like, share, subscribe on all your social media and share with all your friends. If you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast, or you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account where you can give a one-time donation. Also, be sure to check out our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We have t-shirts and a tote bag that you may purchase if you wish. And also check out our latest movie review, which was of Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Kind of ties into the whole subject matter of today's show. And that will do it for episode 103. We will see you next time. Bye. It is the truth. I tell you no lie. It says so in the Bible. Crash came here from the sky. What do they want? What do they want? What? What? What do they want? What? What? What do they want? What? What?